The liquid helium in the door is at 4.2 degrees. We now want to cool it down to the lambda point and show you the transition to the superfluid phase. Our method will be cooling by evaporation using a vacuum pump. Now, the lambda point lies at 2.2 degrees, only 2 degrees colder than the present temperature of the liquid. What's more, not very much heat has to be removed from the liquid helium now in the doer to bring it to the lambda point. It amounts to only about 250 calories. Nevertheless, don't get the idea that this cooling process is easy. On the contrary, it's quite difficult. More than one-third of the liquid helium now in the doer has to be pumped away in vapor form before we can get what remains behind to the lambda point. That requires an awful lot of pumping and explains why we use this large and powerful vacuum pump over here. Even with this pump, the cooling process takes a considerable amount of time. it is so difficult to cool liquid helium to the lambda point. I have already mentioned that liquid helium has a remarkably small heat of vaporization, only five calories per gram. At the same time, liquid helium at 4.2 degrees has a high specific heat, almost one calorie per gram. Therefore, one gram of the vapor pumped away carries with it an amount of heat which can cool only five or six grams of liquid helium by one degree. That's not very much cooling. It is less by a factor of almost a hundred than when we cool water by evaporation. The situation gets even worse as cooling progresses below 4.2 degrees because the specific heat of liquid helium rises astonishingly as we approach 2.17 degrees, the lambda point. The heat of vaporization, on the other hand, remains roughly the same. So, a given amount of vapor carried off produces less and less cooling as we approach 2.17 degrees. Our thermometer here is a low pressure gauge connected to the space above the liquid helium. The needle registers the pressure there. It is the saturated vapor pressure of liquid helium. The gauge is calibrated to the corresponding temperature. We call it a vapor pressure thermometer. As we approach 2.17 degrees, boiling becomes increasingly violent. Suddenly it stops. This was the transition. The liquid you now see is helium-2. Even though evaporation does continue, there is no boiling. Normal liquids, such as the water in this beaker, boil because of their relatively low heat conductivity. Before heat, added at one point, can be carried away to a cooler place in the liquid, bubbles of the vapor form. Helium-1 behaves like a normal liquid in this respect. The absence of boiling in helium-2 reveals that this phase acts as if it had a large heat conductivity. As a matter of fact, as the liquid helium passed through the lambda point transition you just saw, its heat conductivity increased by the fantastic factor of one million. The heat conductivity of helium-2 
is many times greater than in the metals silver and copper, which are among the best solid heat conductors. And yet, here we deal with a liquid. For this alone, helium-2 deserves the name of superfluid. Actually, the way in which helium-2 transports such large quantities of heat so rapidly is totally different from the classical concepts for heat conduction. I'll come back to the subject later in connection with an experiment demonstrating the phenomenon of second sound in helium-2. Remember that this great change in heat conductivity occurs at a single, a fixed transition temperature, the lambda point. We do indeed deal with a change in phase, only here it is a change from one liquid to another liquid. As we've told you before, the specific heat of liquid helium is very large at the lambda point. In fact, it behaves abnormally even below the lambda point and falls again very rapidly with the temperature. This discontinuity in specific heat is another reflection of the fact that we are dealing with a change in the phase of the substance. By the way, the curve resembles the Greek letter lambda. The transition temperature got its name from the shape of this curve. We are in for more surprises. The next one has to do with the viscosity of liquid helium. When a normal liquid flows through a tube, it will resist the flow. In this experiment, we shall cause some glycerin to flow through a tube under its own weight. The top layer is colored glycerin. The liquid layer closest to the tube wall adheres to it. The layer next in from the one touching the wall flows by it and is retarded as it flows due to the interatomic, the van der Waals force of attraction. The second layer, in turn, drags on the third and so on inward from the wall, producing fluid friction or viscosity. The narrower the tube, the slower the liquid's rate of flow through it under a given head of pressure. Here I have a beaker with an unglazed ceramic bottom of ultrafine porosity. Many capillary channels run through this ceramic disc. Their diameter is quite small, about one micron, which is one ten thousandth of a centimeter. There is liquid helium in the beaker. It is at 4.2 degrees Kelvin. Helium-1, the normal phase. The capillaries in the disc are fine enough to prevent the liquid now in the beaker from flowing through under its own weight. Clearly, helium-1 is viscous. To be sure, its viscosity is very small. That's why we had to choose extremely fine capillaries to demonstrate it. Here you see the lambda point transition. The helium-2 all pours out. The rate of pouring would not be noticeably slower if the porosity were made yet finer. We call this kind of flow a superflow. The temperature is now at 1.6 degrees. The superflow is even faster. The viscosity of helium-2 in this experiment is so small that it has not been possible to find a value for it. It is less than the experimental uncertainty incurred in attempts to measure it. We now believe that helium-2, the superfluid, has zero viscosity, although we should be more precise here. We believe its viscosity is zero when observing capillary flow. Bear this statement in mind, for we will come up with a contradiction to it in the next experiment, where we will look for viscosity by a different method.